Tom Quee presents The Royal Ramble, an episode-by-episode -episode celebration of the classic British sitcom The Royal Family. To get in touch with the show, email us at theroyalramblepod at gmail.com. Hey everyone, it's Tom Quee here, back with another edition of The Royal Ramble, our long-form Royal Family discussion podcast. I hope you're well. Have you had your teas? I'll keep this quick. As always, you can follow us at the Royal Ramble Pod on Twitter, where I post a lot of the updates for the show. You can get in touch with me, the Royal Ramble Pod at gmail.com. We're on all the different platforms, wherever your RSS feed takes you, essentially. So we're on Spotify, iTunes. Please leave a iTunes review if you are so kind. And everywhere else as well, YouTube, etc. If you really enjoy the show, you really want to give back to the show, we have the Patreon, which helps keep the lights on over here at Royal Ramble HQ. So basically how that works is you support the show and you get premium access. So whenever I'm releasing an episode, so in this case we're releasing Babysitting Again, the second episode of Season 3, uh, the same day I release that, also on the Patreon I release next month's episode. So that's the legendary decorating. So if you can't get enough Royal Ramble fun and you want to support the show, head over to the Patreon. It's greatly appreciated. So all those things are there. And uh, just one quick email before we discuss today's episode, and it's a very brief one from Ben. Ben says, hey, hi, mate. Just wanted to say you're doing a fantastic job. Love the show. Thanks, Ben. And thank you, Ben. I appreciate the short but sweet praise there. And indeed, if you have any emails, guys, you want to get in touch with me, you want to talk about the show, you want to talk about my thoughts on the show, or indeed, you just want to say that I'm doing a good job like Ben, uh, get in touch with me, the Royal Ramble Pod at gmail.com. I also accept insults and criticisms as well. So yeah, let's get into today's episode, which is Babysitting Again. This is written by Karen and Ahern and Craig Cash, directed by Karen and Ahern, and it first transmitted on the 23rd of October, 2000. So we open with Anthony heading downstairs, and despite us being in the third series now, there's still even more of this mysterious house being revealed to us for the first time, as here we get a full shot of the hallway, which runs from the front door into the kitchen. Anthony's clearly just woken up. He's wearing that classic staid pyjama garb combo of top and shorts. And we can see from the front door that it's daytime. I mean, morning, it must be. There's light filtering in. So as well as this new starting location of sorts, I mean, I get that it's just a bloody bit of the corridor. You know, as well as here, we also have this and a new time of day to be explored. Morning. Or, I suppose, a typical morning, rather than the most important one of Dave and Denise's life, which ends the first series. And, you know, I love, I mean, I mentioned this many times, I love how the show plays with the variety of different dimensions. You know, how they can showcase these same four walls. We've had tea times, of course, but also Sunday dinner, late night after boozing, Christmases, the aforementioned nascent nuptial natterings, and, you know, and here we have something new yet again. So Ant manoeuvres around the detritus, and it's clear from the off here that baby David has had a huge impact on the household. I mean, by the looks of things, you'd imagine he'd live there 24-7. We can see all his clothes drying on the radiator, the unkempt pram blocking a clean way through. There is naturally in the background some TV going on, some morning TV, and Anthony heads into the kitchen, all six foot something of him, the lanky streak of piss that he is. He's grabbing some cereal, some little man cereal by the looks of it, and I tried to Google around for this, but I couldn't find too much. I know that this is an old school cereal from back in the day, I certainly don't remember it, but yeah, I noticed it was little man. So he grabs a bowl, and just as he pours the cereal into the bowl, Barbara calls from the lounge, asking if it's him in there, and he reacts like, well, who else could it be? You know, it's Barb, though, Barb ever the mother. She's just looking out for her son, telling him to use the milk in the packet as the bottle stuff is Denise's express milk. He was literally about to touch the fridge, and she told him this. I mean, her instincts are uncanny. And I like how prior to this, as well as Anthony's readying the breakfast, we see him eating a few flakes off the top of the bowl before he goes for the milk. I mean, the show is so relatable as ever. You don't really see that on TV much. We can also see in the kitchen on the worktop a bottle steriliser, which is more subtle demonstrations of the encroachment of baby David onto the whole royal family unit. And Ant then pours some milk on his flakes, grabs a spoon and heads into the lounge. And now here's something interesting. This is like an odd kind of Easter egg thing that I just noticed. Or it's not even an Easter egg, it's more of a flub. But basically... Watch this scene. Get this episode up. Watch this scene. On Anthony's forehead, as he moves from the kitchen, there seems to be a little snatch of white, almost from the film itself, like the filtration or whatever didn't scan. I don't really know the terms for it, you know, but just look out for that, as it's something kind of odd that slipped through. And uh, and I know, you know, we like the granular here at Raw Ramble, and this is maybe going a bit too far, pointing out when little bits of the film stock become unspooled, as it were. But yeah, look out for that on your next viewing. 
Anyway, into more tangible things now, like a grandmother loving her grandson. And Barb has got him, baby David, propped up on her knees, and she is positively beaming, jostling him playfully as she laughs. And the two of them seem to look up in tandem as Ant enters and then plants down with his cornflakes, trying to get some peace for a second here, but aware, no doubt, that he'll be up again soon enough. Aww. <laughs> He's got his own life in front of him. I wonder what he's thinking. I wonder what he's thinking, she asks. Uh, there's then a nice shot change, with baby David on the lap, looking to his grandma as the TV plays behind. Barb has the dummy in her grasp, and baby David as ever is dressed charmingly. I mean, maybe he isn't parented that well, but you can't underestimate the Freds. Answering his mom, Ant says that baby David will be thinking, where are my mum and dad? And Barb counters that it's their first night out. Well, apart from the last one, and there's probably been a few more additionally as well. They haven't had him this week, we hear, with Barb saying that earlier when Denise was expressing the milk, she had to cover the baby's ears for all the naughty words she was saying. Yet again, signs that Denise perhaps isn't too clean of a fit for motherhood, though admittedly, I imagine expressing milk is quite painful. Barb asks Anthony if Five Bellies is up yet, which is a funny name for Jim, which is reminiscent slightly of his own cattle-like descriptions of people, you know, O'Reilly's Ball for Cheryl, Heifer for a friend, the Big Bride from Hyde. Ant doesn't know when his dad will be up, though. And Barb then asks if he's going to the precinct. He says he expects to be, and she asks for some pseudocreme for baby David's arsehole. There's something she isn't happy with there. And Barb, look out for this. Barb and baby David's bum. You know, she's obsessed with it, really, as it goes through. We've heard her talking about it already before in a past episode. Barb then goes to take Jim's brew up, so she passes off baby David to Anthony, placing him between himself and his bowl. And pseudocreme, by the way, is an over-the-counter medicated cream aimed primarily at the treatment of nappy rash. It contains a water repellent base, protective and emollient agents, antibacterial and antifungal agents, and a weak anaesthetic. In Belgium, the product is sold under the brand Dermacreme, and the Netherlands was the first country where pseudocreme was sold outside Ireland and the UK. So Barb puts down the dummy with him, and in a cute, probably unscripted moment, the small child grips Anthony's cereal bowl and pulls it towards him somewhat. And just as Ant has been sidled with all this stuff, the doorbell goes, with Barbara obviously expecting her son to answer it. She's still mothering, though, from outside the room, like before, looking out for baby David's floppy head. So Ant has to juggle it all around as the doorbell goes again. And as he passes the camera, we can see a weird, like, fish exhibit model in the corner shelf. You know, we've spoken before on the pod about the typically endearing tacky tat that litters this homestead. And uh, that's just another example. We can also see one of baby David's lion toys on the side of the cabinet too. So Anthony opens the door. Of course, we don't see this. We're in the lounge. We just hear this. Anthony opens the door and it's Denise who says hiya, but immediately admonishes her brother for caring lovingly for a child. Hiya. Hiya. Hey, who said you could have baby David? Dave? Get baby David off him. Hiya. Oh, hiya, Ma. You all right? Yeah, you all yeah. right. You all right, Dave? Yeah. Is that Denise projecting there with Anthony, maybe? I mean, Christ, as ever, Anthony just gets on uncomplainingly with whatever job is thrown at him, only to be treated badly for doing it. Dave comes in with the baby that's been passed to him, and Barbara comments on how rough they look from their drinking the night prior. It having, of course, been established many times that Denise in particular can really knock it back, though she's never drank any ethanol, remember. So Dave hugs and holds his son. Denise kind of tickles his fingers really briefly, but doesn't seem to want to embrace her baby, you know, despite him no doubt wanting it. Dave turns him around on his lap and points out the TV, which currently has on classic Saturday morning fare. I mean, something I remember watching a ton as a kid, CD UK. This being the era when Anton Deck was still hosting it, back when CD UK followed SMTV Live. Now, there is an interesting edit that I noticed in this show, and it is something that the producers, the editors, the directors, whatever, these choices that they make to the demands of the overall narrative and programme, but... Anyone that grew up in the UK at this time who would have watched this show, of which they were in their millions, remembers that it was SMTV Live first and then CD UK. However, I mean, it's just me being an eagle-eared listener here, but however, throughout the show, as this episode goes on, it starts with CD UK, but then there's like clips of SMTV Live in the background, which just doesn't make sense because, you know, it was SMTV first. But, you know, I understand why they did it. And again, it's not like Millionaire where they're kind of referring to it and stuff like that. It's just a great accompaniment. And it's just a fantastic choice. They always know how to put the perfect program on to suit the setting. Think about when we had Antiques Roadshow on the Sunday afternoon, and here we have classic Saturday morning fair in SMTV Live. And let's talk about SMTV Live briefly, but before we do that, of course, we have to talk about Anton Deck. Ant and Deck are a British television presenting duo consisting of comedians, television presenters, and singers Ant McParlin and Declan Donnelly, who are both from Newcastle upon Tyne. 
Formed after their meeting as child actors on CBBC's drama Biker Grove, they perform together as pop musicians PJ and Duncan, the names of the characters from the series. And of course from there they've gone on to be, I think it's fair to say the most popular TV entertainers of their generation, you know, certainly of my generation. Indeed, in 2004, a poll for the BBC named Anton Deck as the 18th most influential people in British culture. And as of 2021, they have jointly won the award for most popular TV presenters at the National Television Awards for 20 years running. Now onto the programme, well, SMTV Live, which is an abbreviation of Saturday Morning Television Live, was a British Saturday morning children's programme produced by Blaze Television for ITV. Operating on a similar format to other Saturday morning programmes for children, such as BBC's Live and Kicking, the programme premiered on the 29th of August 1998 and ran for over 270 episodes across five years before its conclusion on the 27th of December 2003. The programme's format focused on a collection of sketches, competitions and challenges, alongside a compilation of children's programmes and cartoons. The programme proved a major success, contributing to furthering the careers of Anton Deck, as well as promoting the broadcast of Japanese anime series Pokemon on British television. Now, I do remember watching Pokemon, for, I love Pokemon personally, and I remember watching Pokemon for the first time on SMTV Live, and yeah, they were just a match made in heaven, undeniably. And then after SMTV Live was CD UK, which is Countdown UK, which is now a defunct music TV programme, which is kind of like the chart, although I guess the chart technically came out on the Sunday, so it's kind of like a predecessor to the chart coming out and stuff like that, and they'd have live performance performances and whatnot and you know when you just read things and it just opens up a whole new world in your memory bank on the wikipedia article they talk about cd uk being sponsored by tizer do you guys remember tizer there's an old school uk fizzy drink brand and i was like yes i totally remember watching smtv live watching pokemon wanting tizer like all came flooding back Anyway, back to the show, not only are we seeing this 90s relic of CD UK, but when the camera pans across to the TV, Ant is asking something else that we don't hear anymore in culture. He's asking listeners to have the bill payer's permission before dialing in for one of those multiple choice contests. You know the ones with the really obvious question. So back to baby David now, and Barb says we didn't hear a peep out of him all night. And Denise says who? I mean... <laughs> Who did you think was being spoken of here, Jim? And Barbara then fires another one of her trademark worried looks on behalf of Denise's motherhood. Barbara's always perks herself up straight away, though, and asks if the couple would like a bacon butty. Then asking Ant to do it because, of course, no good deed goes unpunished. It's great to see the beleaguered couple of Dave and Denise answering, yes, please, in unison. Ant just unfolds his arms, takes his cereal with him and gets to work. And baby David looks so cute here on Dave's lap. I mean, they really have kitted him out proper. And interestingly, around Dave's neck, just because we're quite close to him at this point, we can see a small crucifix cross. But I imagine that's more for show than any of his religious leanings, you know. So Denise then asks Dave if he can take the baby upstairs. And at first, you think it might just be because she doesn't like him being around. You know, it wouldn't be surprising. But no, it's because she wants a sig. Dave says they're watching Anton Deck, but, but Denise pushes and he relents, taking his son upstairs singing You Are My Sunshine, which we heard in the last episode too. Denise smiles to Barb as they head up, and we can see Denise is rocking the new top she had on, on Barbara's Finally Had Enough, the one that Barbara didn't really take notice of because she was too busy crying about the disaster of her marriage. Now, the show especially in series three, I think, really loves to turn the knife in a bit on the punchlines, as we see demonstrated perfectly here. <laughs> No, Denise, you're really good about that not smoking in front of baby David. Yeah, I know. Well, I'm only doing it till he's old enough to be able to walk out the room himself, and then, you know, well, it's up to him, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, you are a good mother, Denise. Oh, dear. I mean, it's kind of laudable, I suppose, if you're just kind of marking it on a scale that Denise gave up smoking when she was pregnant, although she still seemed to have drank quite a bit. And Barb still blew smoke on her face. So yeah, take that with a pinch of tobacco, I suppose, you know. But this is just an amazing moment. It's so laughable that she's only doing it until he's old enough to walk out the room himself. Then it's up to him, she says. As if he has the mental faculties at that point to understand about carcinogens. Just because he can put one foot in front of the other at a young age. I mean, yeah, hilarious moment. But the inference is so spiky. And we've seen these glances of concern continually from Barb on Denise's parenting. So why does she say you are? a good mother here. Indeed, if Barb was a good mother, she would call out her terrible child. And Barb is a good mother, she's a great mother even. But I guess even the best mothers have blind spots for their kids' foibles, I suppose. So they light up their ciggies, Ant and Deck can be heard talking on the TV, and Cat Dealey gives a big cheer for the West Midlands, which is my stomping ground, I mean Birmingham to be precise. And Deck can be heard donning a slight Brummy accent. 
And Kat Dealey, by the way, Catherine Elizabeth Dealey, is an English TV presenter and actress. From 98 to 2002, she hosted the ITV children's show SMTV Live, for which she won a BAFTA Children's Award in 2001, and its spin-off show CD UK. In 2003, she hosted the talent competition Fame Academy on BBC and became the presenter of the talent show Stars in Their Eyes, hosting until 2005. Since 2006, Dealey has been the host of So You Think You Can Dance in the US, for which she has been nominated five times for a primetime Emmy. And yeah, interestingly, Kat Dealey grew up in Birmingham, nearby Sutton Coalfield and Great Bar, which is, you know, two places where I grew up as well. And the West Mids, gotta give a shout out for the West Mids. The West Midlands is a metropolitan county and combined authority area in western central England, with a 2020 estimated population of 2.9 million, making it the second most populous county in England after Greater London. It appeared as a metropolitan county in 1974, after the passage of the Local Government Act 1972, to cover parts of Staffordshire, Worcestershire and Warwickshire, and embraces seven metropolitan boroughs, the cities of Birmingham, Coventry and Wolverhampton, and the boroughs of Dudley, Sanwell, Solihull and Warsaw. So Barb then compliments Dave on his great daddy skills. Denise says she found him the other night testing the bath water with his elbow, which is a classic kid rearing technique there. And Denise said she'd never do that, to which Barb kind of mutely responds with a nah. But why wouldn't Denise do that going forward? She's seen Dave doing it, so she knows about it, but of course, I guess she never learns. Dave pops back down, takes off his jacket as he'll want to feel the benefit later, and there's another patented shot here of the three of them. Barb at the front, Denise in the middle, and Dave on the end watching. Denise asks if he's all right. Dave says who? (laughs) And Denise clarifies, and Dave says that baby David's sound. Barb smiles at them. You know, it must be such a wonderful feeling, really, to see these two as parents, having seen them grow from a young couple. I mean, it's kind of the same for us, too, isn't it, as viewers? Though, at times, you're kind of watching them more behind your palms (laughs) than with pride. Barb then asks how it went last night, as it was their anniversary. A nice meal was planned, apparently, but they just stopped at the feathers, with Dave essentially repeating this twice as they go back and forth. It's kind of further evidence of his lapse into inertness. So did you have a good time last night? Oh, we never went for a meal in the end. We just stayed in the feathers. <laughs> just went down the feathers. Oh, thought you were going to have a nice meal for your anniversary. Well, we were going to, but... We just stayed at the feathers. We just stopped at the feathers. As long as they had a good time, though, Barb says, which they both agree that they did. Dave says Tony gave them a lift home, who's another side character that we never meet. Denise couldn't even remember, of course, despite the fact that he carried her in. Denise just shrugs and Barbara laughs, both supping on their cigs as they do. So Denise, who didn't see her child all yesterday, then asks Dave if he can call his parents to see if they can have him this afternoon. Dave is reluctant pulls a face they were the ones who took care of him all yesterday but but denise fires back that they are his grandparents <laughs> yeah and you're his mother you know she doesn't want her afternoon naps impacted it seems he's at an awkward stage at the moment denise states but well you know i'm afraid infancy childhood as a whole that, that's just an awkward stage and then we have jim jim comes down and the first thing we see of him before it pans up is naturally his fly he's zipping his fly jim who gives his child a bit of love patting denise on the head as he enters but then following that up with a line of his own they they are his grandparents it's just that he's at this awkward stage now you know what awkward stage is that love (laughs) when he won't go to the office for you Jim, who is in the same garms as ever, by the way, he hasn't changed into something different to start his weekend, of course. Jim greets the new parents, asks after the meal. They say they just had a lock-in. Jim obviously wasn't there. He was here babysitting, but he still got fairly hammered on the cans himself. Denise then says something properly egregious here, and Barb is right to scowl somewhat here to herself, and also glancing somewhat confidentially at Jim. We had a few cans here, didn't we, Bab? Oh, yeah, we got a bit hammered and all, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> Kept the baby monitor on all night, though, didn't he? Oh, you don't need to. I never do. You never keep the baby monitor on. Like, that is... That is pure neglect, that is. I mean, the baby could be... I mean, anything could have happened to the baby, and you just chose not to flick on the on switch. I just, I love it. I love how deep they're digging in with Denise as a bad mother here. It's really unrepentant, isn't it? Jim asks about the old karaoke there. I mean, what a classic pub fixture. And Denise brings up an old face that we haven't heard about for a while. Oh, should have seen, you know, Beverly Macker. She did that song out of Titanic. Mm-hmm. Oh, she was right state, wasn't she? Mm, yeah, she was stood there like she was at the front of the boat, you know, like that girl in the film, the uh, Titanic. And I want to point out again 
how delicate this dialogue is written, how real. Denise doesn't say, oh, Beverly Macker did that song out of Titanic. She says, oh, you should have seen, you know Beverly Macker, which is a minor change, but just feels more genuine, you know, really dig that. And karaoke, by the way, which is Japanese for empty orchestra, as everyone knows, is a type of interactive entertainment usually offered in clubs and bars where people sing along to recorded music using a microphone. The music is an instrumental version of a well-known popular song, and the lyrics are usually displayed on a video screen along with a moving symbol, changing colour, or music video images to guide the singer. In Chinese-speaking countries and regions such as mainland China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Singapore, a karaoke box is called a KTV, and the global karaoke market has been estimated to be worth nearly 10 billion dollars. So Dave again seems a little dim-witted here as he confirms that Beverly was there and she stood up. She was like Kate Winslet in Titanic like Rose. You know, certainly funny to imagine her up there getting all the attention with what is admittedly a very difficult song to sing. And, you know, Denise there sitting in the corner and her that's seething as all the eyes are on her. Jim then talks about Titanic, says it's a good film, and he doesn't focus, though, on the incredible special effects or the love story amidst the historical tragedy. No, Jim focuses on the bit where Rose was naked and Jack painted her, emphasising that, like Beverly, she's blessed somewhat upstairs and cups his own man boobs to illustrate. Denise laughs awkwardly, Dave gives a clandestine nod, scrunching his eyes. Barb, though, is unimpressed, staring at him annoyed. And Titanic, well, Titanic, of course, is a 1997 American epic romance and disaster film directed, written, produced, and co-edited by James Cameron. Upon its release on December 19th, 1997, Titanic received significant critical and commercial success and later received numerous accolades. Nominated for 14 Academy Awards, it tied All About Eve for the most Oscar noms and won 11, including awards for Best Picture and Best Director, tying Ben-Hur for the most Oscars won by a single film. With an initial gross of over $1.84 billion, Titanic was the first film to reach the billion-dollar mark. It remained the highest-grossing film of all time until Cameron's own Avatar passed it in 2010. And the song My Heart Will Go On is a song recorded by Canadian singer Celine Dion, with the song's music being composed by James Horner and the lyrics written by Will Jennings. It is considered Dion's signature song, and with worldwide sales estimated over 18 million copies, it is the second best-selling physical single by a woman in music history, and one of the best-selling physical singles of all time. It was also the world's best single of 1998. The song, though, has also received criticism. In 2011, Rolling Stone readers ranked it the seventh worst song of the 1990s, with the magazine writing, quote, Celine Dion's song and the movie have aged very poorly. Now the song probably just makes you cringe. With finally Maxim describing it as the second most tragic event to result from that fabled ocean liner. I mean, I don't don't mind Heart Will Go On. I don't mind the film Titanic, to be honest with you. I watched it a few years ago, and it really holds up. So Beverly was in there a fair bit, it seems. She did Shania Twain, and she was dead shite at it, Denise says. Dave doesn't seem to remember, but when pushed by Denise, he repeats dolefully that she was bad. Jim kind of looks at them dismissively, thinking maybe that he would never be like that. He would never be like Dave under the thumb, but, I mean, we've seen him plenty of times very submissive to Barbara. And Shania Twain, well, that's Eileen Regina Shania Twain, who is a Canadian singer and songwriter. She has sold over 100 million records, making her the best-selling female artist in country music history and one of the best-selling musical artists of all time. Denise, of course, did some karaoke too, doing My Chico Latino by Jerry Halliwell three times, which is a bit overkill. I mean, I bet the Feathers lot resented her a bit more than Bev. Now, when the song was mentioned in this episode, I couldn't really recall it. So I would have been in seven at the time of this being released. And I do have a bit of a memory for, like, you know, the late 90s kind of musical culture. But as soon as I put it on Spotify, yeah, again, like SMTV Live, like Tizer, it all came flooding back. And uh, Mi Chico Latino, which is English for My Latin Boy, is a song recorded by Jerry Halliwell for a debut album, Schizophonic. It is a Latin pop song, which is centered on a lost love theme. The song was written by Halliwell in order to pay homage to a mother who has Spanish background, and it also has Spanish lyrics. Lots of music mentioned up top in this episode, and Dave even got involved in the singing. I mean, he is a music man, DJ after all, but it's very hard to imagine him doing Live in La Vida Loca, you know, especially Series 3 Dave. And again, that's a hard song to sell, you know. And Live in La Vida Loca, of course, is a song recorded by Puerto Rican singer Ricky Martin for his fifth studio album and his English language debut, Ricky Martin. A Latin pop song, it is about an irresistible, particularly sinister wild woman who lives on the edge, seducing others into a crazy world. The song song received overwhelmingly positive reviews from music critics who complimented its lyrics and danceable rhythm. It was ranked as the best 90s pop song by Elle and listed among the best Latin songs of all time by Billboard. 
In the UK, it debuted at number one and stayed there for three weeks, making Martin the first Puerto Rican artist in history to hit number one. And, you know, I'm sure you guys remember as well, this song was everywhere. And this is, again, another classic. Really difficult to think of uh, Dave Best there on the mic. But I love the follow-up as well. If people remember She Bangs, that was another good Ricky Martin track. Maybe I need to do a little Ricky Martin pod in the future. On second thoughts, maybe not. Jim despairs for himself that he'll be living La Vida Loca if he doesn't get his bacon sarnie soon. Unsure if Anthony has put any under for him. So, like Denise, he asks Barb to ask Anthony rather than just asking his son or perish the fort doing it himself. Anthony doesn't say anything in response, just looks up through the corridor, but Jim decries the gob on him, calling him a lazy little git as Ant fetches more out the fridge. And there's a nice shot here too with Jim sat watching TV and Ant working hard behind him. We can also see a kid's play cube too with all the letters and animals on it. You know, another sign yet again of baby David's stranglehold in this family household. It's uh, a whole new kind of tat, if you will. And now what happens next is actually very sweet. But of course, Jim plays it for laughs and uses it as ammunition for a dig. I was here last night, man, when we was in the feathers. Dave got his pictures out of baby David and he got all upset. What, again? Yeah. Who was that? Dave. <laughs> I mean, again, God, Dave's got a bit of a rep here. And this is great. I'm sure it's probably the last time. But what must have Beverly Macker been thinking last night seeing Dave like that? And it's interesting that Denise says that Jim was exactly the same, which is nice to hear. We have, after all, seen how soppy he can be on the Christmas special just gone. But Jim, too, can't let that slide. And says that he actually regrets those tears. He didn't realise what they'd be like when they were older. Denise counters back on this by saying that she's given him a grandchild, thank you very much. And Jim quite rightly says, oh, you're dead right there, you have given him to us, which is perceptive and deep. Denise actually gasps at this, and Barb says to take no notice. Jim's daughter then says it's nice that he knows his grandparents so well, baby David. But I mean, he's a few months old. He doesn't know anything at this point. And when Jim fires back, it's, it's hard to argue. I think it's great that baby David knows his grandparents so well. It's his bloody parents he doesn't know. I tell you what, he'd have difficulty picking you out in the crowd, Denise. Very harsh, but the fact that Denise says nothing in return kind of says it all, I suppose. There's then silence for a second. We can hear the clatter of Sarnies in the back. Jim sheepishly looks up and, and asks after the farmyard. Dave gives an update. He's made the pond for the ducks that are one of Denise's old vanity mirrors, but he stuck the wrong side down, so the ducks are a bit magnified. He's also brought a frog, but he didn't check for the size difference, so it's all misshapen. He also says that he couldn't take the whole farmyard around with him, as that would be stupid. Again, this is a royal family all over, isn't it? But where in the past we've just had characters or situations we don't see, here we have a whole playset of sorts slowly being built up, and Jesus Dave, as ever, heart in the right place, but brain seemingly in no place. Denise says, well, Jim never made them one as a kid, with Jim firing back that with killer frogs on the loose it's probably all for the best. Old Basin Head then comes into the lounge bearing bacon sandwiches, and Jim happily receives his. Ecstatically, we might say. (laughs) Jim, as we've seen many times, gets joy from the little things in life. Pomaine, chocolate bars, chippy tea in an upcoming episode. You know, and here he's no different. Calling for brown sauce as Dave calls for red. And, of course, knowing that Dave likes red sauce from the fracar over not giving it him in the opening of season two. Dave also thanks Anthony as Budley here, like Anthony and Buddy combined. Something he did the last time when he had a bacon sandwich. I'm not sure if that's a conscious callback, but it's sweet. And brown sauce, brown sauce being a condiment served with food in the UK and Ireland, normally dark brown in colour. The ingredients include a varying combination of tomatoes, molasses, dates, apples, taramin, spices, vinegar, and sometimes raisins. The taste is either tart or sweet with a peppery flavour similar to that of Worcestershire sauce. A combination of malt vinegar or water and brown sauce, known simply as sauce or chippy sauce, is popular on fish and chips in Edinburgh, Scotland. Between 2013 and 2014, the sales of brown sauce in the UK decreased by approximately 19%, according to the market research company Mintel. But fear not, more than 13 million kg is still consumed every year. Denise stubs out a ciggy and gets eating... Ant brings in the sauces, seemingly not wanting to make a sandwich for himself like he did last time. And the red sauce is the same bottle we saw when Anthony and Darren used it with the sausage and mash in the last episode. Dave slowly takes the top slice off of his sandwich and pops the ketchup in. Jim takes the cap off the glass bottle of brown sauce and gets it dispersed. I really like too how these aren't branded bottles like Heinz or Daddy's or whatever. No, these are more of a budget offering, you know, with the sauce dried into the packaging like they always are. Again, 
the detail on this show is just exquisite. And Jim, he's just in seventh heaven here, singing his own version of Living La Vida Loca, moving the sandwich around his mouth like a harmonica, chuckling as he bites into it, pumping his fist in the air in delight, rubbing his hands together in glee. I mean, it's just a bacon bloody sandwich, you know. And on the background on the TV, Challenge Ant can be heard. Now, Challenge Ant is something that I remember as well. This is a long recurring competition on SMTV Live where a visitor would challenge Ant to a general knowledge quiz. Each week, a child would challenge Ant by asking him 10 questions they had prepared, usually based on the week's showbiz news. For everyone Ant did not answer correctly, the child won a prize, such as a DVD or a video game. At the end of the 10 questions, the child would have the chance to gamble the prizes they had won for the Star Prize, which was usually a DVD player or games console. They then asked Ant a further question called the killer question with an accompanying dramatic sound effect and this is kind of what you can hear in the background of the show if Ant answered incorrectly the child and audience would chant you're thick you're thick you're thick you're thick you know to the tune of ole by the bouncing souls and so on and put a dunce cap on Ant's head. If, however, Ant answered the question correctly, he'd be crowned king of common knowledge to the tune of rocking all over the world, reveling in taunting the child as he was crowned. I mean, honestly, I watched quite a few Challenge Ant clips the other day on YouTube. They're really funny, like, they really hold up. And it's nice and refreshing to see someone being a little nasty to a kid, you know. You don't really see that anymore on TV. Jim can't have fun for long, though. With the sandwich half-eaten, he starts to rub his nipple. He pulls his shirt up and examines it, squeezing his move as he investigates. He then calls to Barb, who was watching the TV, and who turns to him, and I can't imagine she was expecting to see her husband's exposed podgy torso open up for examination. Denise gets upset as they're eating, Barb angrily calls Jim's name, and Jim himself just wets a finger and dabs at his nipple. There's an amazing shot here of Anthony arms folded, watching his father explore his supposed inflammation. His luck is one of disgust, but it seems he can't look away either. Jim then pops it back underneath his shirt and gets back to munching, rubbing the crust and licking his fingers. He comments that someone on TV is a big-headed bugger, obviously referring to Ant. Dave asks who, and Jim says Humpty Dumpty, to which he explodes in laughter at his own tame joke. You know, this is to the point where he rocks in his chair, and his feet rise up in front of the camera. And there's a really nice quick moment here where we can see that his shoes have no real soles to them. You know, they're cheap then, basically. They're not rugged Timberlands, which is another nice touch. Four, you can decide whether you want to gamble for the other four, and the game's console. He's a big headed bug at him. Who? Humpty Dumpty! One nil to our father in law, eh, Dave? Good one, that, James. One nil to the old father in law, Jim says, and Dave says, good one, that, James. You know, it's a minor moment, but fun nonetheless. And Humpty Dumpty? Well, Humpty Dumpty, of course, is a character in an English nursery rhyme, probably originally a riddle, and one of the best known in the English speaking world. He is typically portrayed as an anthropomorphic egg, though he is not explicitly described as such. The first recorded versions of the rhyme date from late 18th century England and the tune from 1870 in James William Eliot's National Nursery Rhymes and Nursery Songs. Its origins are obscure and several theories have been advanced to suggest original meanings. The rhyme does not explicitly state that the subject is an egg, possibly because it may have been originally posed as a riddle. There are various theories of an original Humpty Dumpty, and one, advanced by Catherine Eulis Thomas in 1930 and adopted by Robert Ripley, posits that Humpty Dumpty is King Richard III of England, depicted as humpback in Tudor histories, and particularly in Shakespeare's play, and who was defeated despite his armies at Bosworth Field in 1485. All that is known for certain is that the line, all king's horses and all the king's men, couldn't put Humpty together again, did not mean the horses physically assisted Humpty, but rather was a metaphor for the crown's resources. It's all go, though, in the house here. There's no time to dwell as the bell soon rings and everyone turns to Ant, which chimes nicely with what's on the TV as the contestant is going to gamble on Challenge Ant and an applause breaks out, just as Anthony himself rises and heads to the door to see who it is. It's little Jamie from across the road, another new character we've never heard of before. Maybe he's one of Leggins Lorraine's pre-sterilisation. It's not clear. He's doing a sponsored swim. He can swim, so Jim tells him no. It's for a school minibus, we hear. Something Jim obviously isn't in favour of, seeing as it's just a show for them to Chester Zoo. And Jim then gets in another dig on top of that, decrying that the kids hanging around the corners nearby are like monkeys. And Chester Zoo is a you know, very famous zoo in this country. It's a zoo at Upton by Chester, Cheshire, England. Chester Zoo was opened in 1931. It's one of the UK's largest zoos at 130 acres. And the zoo has a total land holding of approximately 400 acres. It is the most visited wildlife attraction in Britain with more than 2 million visitors in 2019. And in 2007, Forbes described it as one of the 15 best zoos in the world. And in 2017, it was named as the best zoo in the UK and the third in the world by TripAdvisor. Interestingly, in February 2009, the history of Chester 
Zhu was a contestant's chosen subject on Mastermind. That's a tough topic. Throughout all this, by the way, I noticed that weirdly Dave, as he's eating, is holding his ketchup in his hand along with the plate as he scoffs. I mean, why didn't he just pop it on the table like a normal person? So 50p is offered by Barb, 50p for the lot, not per length. Because, yeah, I mean, that could get pretty high unchecked, really. And I always felt this, and if you feel the same way, like, I know they're raising money on that sort of stuff, but I'm like, they're having fun swimming, like, and that, it could get pretty pricey, you know, but, oh well. Bit of a miser like Jim, I suppose. Jimmy was annoyed because Jamie was around the week before just for part of Red Nose Day. And Red Nose Day, also known as Comic Relief, is an operating British charity founded in 1985 by the comedy scriptwriter Richard Curtis and comedian Lenny Henry in response to the famine in Ethiopia. The highlight of Comic Relief's appeal is Red Nose Day, which is an annual, previously biennial, telethon held in March. The first live fundraising event was held on the 4th of April 1986, featuring comedians and pop stars including Rowan Atkinson, Billy Connolly, Stephen Fry, and even Kate Bush. I'm surprised Kate Bush did it, that's pretty cool. Now again, interestingly we have, I mean we've had like Dibley mentioned before in the fast show, here again we kind of have life imitating art, as there will be a Royal Family Comic Relief special, but we'll get to that in due course. Jim said he's sponsoring them for not requesting money from them. Barbara laughs to herself at this and Ant sits back down. Dave splurges more red sauce and says how much he likes it on the sandwich. And Barb comments on an apparent irony. I love red sauce, me. I don't like it. Mm, it's funny that, isn't it? Him liking red sauce and you not liking red sauce and yet you get on so well. Yeah. <laughs> Typical Barb there, trying to find logic where there is none. She then wonders what sauce Baby David will like and Denise coos. Baby David, who in Denise's mind will be able to make his own decision in regards to tobacco smoke around him before he's developed any preference for sauce. Then, a car can be heard pulling up outside. Anne checks the window and it's Mary and Joe getting out of a taxi. The camera pulls out behind and we get a wider shot of the living room. And here we can see Ant and Deck on screen. And there's also a new photo on top of the TV. There's Dave and Denise married, of course, which has also now been joined by a picture of baby David. Dave, Denise and Jim all utter, a taxi. Hey, Mary and Joe's getting out of a taxi. A taxi? Yeah. A taxi? A bloody taxi? Yeah. Where And Barb gets up to check and then opens the door by inviting them in and asking Mary and Joe what happened. It sounds bad by the sounds of it initially. Joe's all bandaged up, but of course we can't quite appreciate it immediately. So the pair then come in, and of course, you know, it's good old Joe and Mary. We love Joe and Mary. How can you not worship these two? And it's been a little while since we last saw them as well. It was back at the end of series two for Anthony's birthday, just as Joe was singing, actually. So Barb ushers Ant off his seat and they enter. Mary seems bereft. They've been down to casualty with Joe, she says, the two fingers of his right hand. Everyone is shocked at first, and there's a great shot of Dave, Denise, Barbara and Jim all trying to get a look in, faces concerned. Joe isn't really saying anything at first, I mean, surprisingly. Mary's speaking for him. Mary in her fancy coat and Joe with a tie on, holding his fingers up aloft. A very comical type of injury, at least visually. <laughs> and how did this happen? Well, it was a cheese grater we hear. Could happen to anyone. Joe complains that they weren't seen too quick enough, but Mary is right to say that there were some heart attacks there, you know. And at the end, there was only Joe and a little boy with a marble lodged in his nose. <laughs> Anthony is sat on the floor by Joe and stifles a laugh before Barb ushers him out to grab Joe a Kit Kat. Jim looks at this a bit confused, but that is Barb's way, isn't it? Getting people to get things for others. Even if they aren't helpful, really, it's more just a sign that you care. And Ant, I mean, Ant managed to hold laughter in when it was marble talk, but the rest of the gang rightly struggle with the next line. Did he have a tetanus, Mary? Oh, yes, Barbara. Just a little prick in his bottom. <laughs> and the tetanus vaccine, also known as tetanus toxoid, is a toxoid vaccine used to prevent tetanus. During childhood, five doses are recommended, with a sixth given during adolescence. After three doses, almost everyone is initially immune, but additional doses every 10 years are recommended to maintain immunity. It's great to see Jim coughing to hide his laughter there, and Mary then vents against the NHS, calling it terrible, saying they had no interest in Joe at all. Joe, who just sits there glumly. I mean, regardless, it seems like a silly thing to go in for, but, you know, he still would have had his hand slashed open against a razor and it would have been bleeding proper. You know, Mary, I bet, is resourceful like Barbara and wouldn't have taken him to the hospital had it not needed proper medical attention. Jim then, ever anally fixated, points out that it's Joe's arse wiping hand, which will no doubt compound his miseries. I hope that's not the owl there. Uh, arse wiping hand, is it, Joe? Tim? Why? <laughs> 
Amazing quote, though, from Mary there. I mean, she really does come out with them, doesn't she? It's a much safer cheese. I mean, she isn't wrong. It's soft. All you have to do is pull that red string. I mean, ask Denise. She's seemingly a dairyly expert. And Jim just scoffs at this from his seat, furrowing his brow and shaking his head quite rightly, deriding in his own way this ridiculous thing that Mary has just uttered. And Mary, ever religious, says that they've just got to hope and pray that the skin grows over the tops, and that the hospital told them to keep the fingers warm and dry. Mary then laments that it's unfair as the cheese wasn't even for him. It was for Cheryl. Of course, something that Jim acts surprised about, and Barb then puts down that response. Everyone in the room looking at him briefly, apart from Joe, who seems fixated on the TV. Joe does look at Jim, though, when he asks him how much a taxi was. Four notes, we hear which Jim calculates as two pints. And I know it's hard times out there at the moment, recording this in 2022, but four pound ain't too bad for a taxi, to be honest. And it certainly doesn't get you two pints anymore. I mean, in a lot of places, it doesn't get you one. Mary then says for them to get back, as Cheryl will be really worried. I mean, would she? It's kind of hard to imagine her fretting over this from what we've seen of her. Jim again chips in, saying she's probably not worried, just starving, <laughs> which Denise fires back on, and then says she hopes Joe's okay. Joe and Mary then head off and Barb draws her own slightly absurd logic back into proceedings. Joe, I hope we feel better soon. Yeah, right. We'd better be off. Oh, oh Joe, you're better going round the back with them fingers. I mean, why? Is it like the shame of the injury or something more obscure in her head? It, it's unclear. She did say something in season one about like having a roast in the summer or not being bothered or something like that. So, you know, it's not unheard of of Barbara to make these odd leaps of logic. Joe thanks her for the Kit Kat. He's told don't be daft any time, and then a club is offered for later. And Ant, who had just jumped back into the seat as Joe left it, is pretty much instantly summoned out in the kitchen to fetch one. Sweet Mary asks how baby David is. Sweet Mary asks how baby David is. And we learn that she too, Mary, has been babysitter, having him on the past Wednesday when he didn't make a peep. So we've got Jim and Bob, Dave's parents, and Joe and Mary. But you imagine more Mary and Cheryl in that last case. I mean, even if Joe wanted to hold the baby, he'd probably struggle to now. So Ant hands across the club and they all pop off with goodbyes. Everyone says ta in chorus. And there's a small silence before they all break out into the laughter that they've been working so hard to hold in. Clean <laughs> cheese! <laughs> you having that, David? Bloody great Jim, bloody cheese! Oh, Jim, don't be awful. Well, how old is he, Bob? Bloody hell, it's a good job he never lost his hand, isn't it? He'd have gone out to me with a whole tin of bloody biscuits. <laughs> Funny exchange here. I mean, Jim again talking directly to Dave as a buttress for the gag. He really seems to be relishing the father-in-law, son-in-law dynamic here. You know, Joe's putting the grill on, he says, so they need some safety goggles. And, you know, this is one of my favourite things in the show, when the cameras reminisce and talk about old stories, such as, you know, think about Jeanette's ironing mark on the back of the wedding dress or or nana falling in the precinct something of course which is still spoken of today and yet joe by the sounds of it is really a walking disaster zone i mean we hear about him moving a fridge freezer and breaking both toes which is wow for which he got a packet of jaffa cakes for that i mean he'd be popular with betty then i suppose i love the lingering laughter and tittering here and dave then asks if trisha isn't on seeming to forget that there's different schedules on during the weekend denise then asks barb if she watched it yesterday she didn't Jim says those programs are bloody rubbish, but Denise said it was brilliant anyway. The episode we hear features a guy of his wife and his mistress, and he actually had to choose between them. Jim, of course, though, is a hypocrite to the fullest extent. He decries the show, Trisha, but he's watched it as well, and he then gets on his soapbox. Oh, she was a look at the mistress, I'll give you that, but it's bloody rubbish, isn't it? See, that's what's wrong with British television today, Dave. They're giving too many women their own bloody programs, aren't they? You've got bloody Lorraine, bloody Trisha, bloody Vanessa, bloody Esther! Bloody Oprah, bloody Ricky, bloody Lake, and they're all talking a load of bollocks. I mean, you've only got to sit in the house where women talk a load of bloody bollocks. I mean, you don't want that on the box, do you? Most of these are references to shows we've heard before, but there's a few new names cropping up too, like Esther and Oprah. So Esther is Dame Esther Louise Ranson, DBE, an English journalist and TV presenter who presented the BBC television series That's Life for 21 years, from 1973 until 1994. She works with various charitable causes and founded the charities Childline, promoting child protection, which was set up in 1986, and the Silver Line, designed to combat loneliness in older people's lives, which she set up in November 2012. And Esther is the British talk show that she presented that was aired on BBC Two from 1994 until 2002, with over 600 episodes made. 
And Oprah, I mean, what a giant. Oprah is an American talk show host, TV producer, actress, author, philanthropist. She's best known for her talk show, The Oprah Winfrey Show, which broadcast from Chicago and was the highest rated TV program of its kind in history and ran in national syndication for 25 years from 1986 to 2011. Dubbed the queen of all media, she was the richest African-American of the 20th century and was once the only black billionaire and the greatest black philanthropist in US history. By 2007, she was sometimes ranked as the most influential woman in the world. And, you know, this again, Jim's little rant there, is testament to his mercurial nature. He just had the whole room in hysterics talking about Joe, and now he's lecturing them, mouthing off with foam-flecked fury from his chair. Ant gets the family focused, though, again, when he harks back to Jerry Springer. And Jerry Springer, of course, is an American syndicated tabloid talk show that aired from September 91 to July 2018. Produced and hosted by its namesake, Jerry Springer, it aired for 27 seasons and nearly 5,000 episodes. The program was unsuccessful in the ratings in its first seasons due to its focus on more political issues. This led to an overhaul of the structure which, by the mid-90s, led to the show as it's now known, filled with controversial topics such as incest and adultery, profanity, physical fights and scantily clad guests. Critical response to the show was mostly negative, and in 2002, TV Guide proclaimed it to be the worst TV show of all time. So Jerry's mentioned, which leads to Jim talking of an episode with a, quote, bloody big black woman who came on. It turns out she was a man, I mean, this is not very woke, is it? With the fiancé having a bigger pair of balls than him. You know what I mean, Dave, Jim says. Why does he keep doing this during this particular episode? It's an interesting nuance, but, but never is he as much before or since harking to Dave for approval. That's America, isn't it, Jim, Dave says. But Jim rightly says that it's all the same here. Barb can't imagine it. She says she moans about Jim, but she doesn't have that problem. Again, another veiled reference to their sex life, which I appreciate throughout. I mean, we've had Beast My Ass, uh, the end of episode two, and Barb asks if Jim fancies an early night. And I think one of the specials, one of the newer specials, I think it's the new sofa, ends with Jim and Barb literally about to have sex, and then Jim leaving on account of the rhubarb. And when he leaves, he's not got any undies on, and we can actually have a proper look, our first look, at his fabled ass. So Jim talks about the wedding night there. You might just want to grin and bear it, he says. Though Barb doesn't approve. Especially not saying it in front of the baby monitor. Denise then gets excited, telling Barb about Baby Gap opening up in the precinct. Barb is also excited and Denise says she loves getting baby stuff from Baby Gap. It's probably the only thing she does enjoy doing for him. It's important to her. You know, she doesn't want him getting teased for not having designer gear. I mean, boy, who? He's not even at the nursery for a few years. You know, Jim says he's got more stuff than baby Brooklyn, which is kind of an interesting reference following on for his reference to Dave and Denise's Posh and Bex in the last episode. And Baby Gap, well, The Gap Inc., commonly known as Gap Inc. or Gap, is an American worldwide clothing and accessory retailer. It is the largest speciality retailer in the U.S. and is the third in total international locations. As of September 2008, the company has approximately 135,000 employees and operates 3,700 stores worldwide, of which 2,400 are located in the U.S. Now, I don't know if anyone else felt this, so I grew up in 92 and Gap was around in the U.K., of course, but the joke here was that it was gay and proud, and... I genuinely think that really hurt its brand. Like, I know it's silly to say, and like, you know, I'm the biggest opponent of homophobia, but it's like weird that that was a thing. And when you were a little kid, you don't, oh, it's not gay, it's not gay. And like, I remember as a kid refusing to wear stuff, my brother and other friends, we didn't want to wear it just because it was gay and proud. I mean, how unfortunate for Gap, right? And Brooklyn Beckham, he was born in 1999, an English model and photographer, the eldest son of David Beckham and Victoria Beckham. He also does a little bit of photography on the side, and his first book of photography, entitled What I See, was published in June 2017. Critical reactions were mixed to negative. A handful of leaked photos became the focus of ridicule on Twitter, with users lampooning the terrible photographs and even worse captions. However, Random House, Beckham's publisher, defended the book as reflecting the interests of his teenage fan base. So Jim points out that Dave's sacrificing his own money and time for this kid, as if it's a bad thing. You know, talking about Daryl on toast after Dave talks about baby David being all logoed up and the importance of that, you know. But to Jim, he doesn't want baby David swanning around like Calvin bloody Klein. Calvin Klein, Calvin Richard Klein, obviously being an American fashion designer who launched a company that would be Calvin Klein Inc. in 1968. In addition to clothing, he's also given his name to a range of perfumes, watches and jewellery. There's then silence for a second as they all watch TV. Barbara absently playing with a bib of sorts. Denise looking forward. And then the baby monitor comes on. There's some gentle burbling from upstairs. Even some laughter in the mix. Jim looks up and smiles proudly. And Denise R's to Dave who R's back. He kind of has to be nudged to R but he does R back eventually. They listen further and soon the giggles turn to cries. And then the cries turn to moans. Blimey, Denise says. And everyone pretends that they can't hear it despite it being piped in loud and clear from the monitor. 
Denise urges Dave to go up and do it, but he rightly says that he just put him up, so why should he have to do it? It sounds a bit like na 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 what the baby's saying, and Denise asks Barb if she doesn't want to go check in on her grandson. And then it gets even worse. Oh, I can't bear hearing him like that. Do I see Oh, yes, please. <clears throat> You know, she can't bear him like she couldn't bear the dirty nappy in the sense where she's saying it in the context of how it affects herself more than anything. Jim then looks up absently to the ceiling, not enjoying this. And Denise asked Ant if he couldn't do it, who fires back a kiss my ass, One that would normally get a laugh from Jim. But seeing this as an opportunity for the quiet to commence, he then jumps on his son, seizes this moment, calls him a lazy little sod in a mealy mouth kind of way. You You know the way Jim sometimes does that with his teeth grinding. So Ant rises, Jim decries his inertness, and Denise just just doesn't seem to get it, does she? Leave our Anthony. He'd have left him crying all day. And he's his uncle. I love that Barb defends Ant and says that, you know, well, he is good with baby David, which he is, with Jim attributing that to them being the same mental age. Something Denise can't abide by, claiming that baby David is miles brighter than Anthony. Now, we've seen Denise just have a laugh and a joke with people, but she delivers this not in a piss-takey way, but with some venom, like as if she believes it, which is even more frightening. You know, she's again trying to dig in when she knows that she should be the one trudging up the stairs. She should be enjoying this, you know, mothering her child. But no, as we're going to get to, she just wants to get out of there. So it's all tense for a moment. Jim turns off the monitor, checks his watch, and asks Dave if he fancies a Saturday lunchtime drinky poo. Hair of the dog, as Dave says. And I was thinking, where does that phrase come from? So, hair of the dog, which is short for hair of the dog that bit you, is a colloquial expression in the English language, predominantly used to refer to alcohol that is consumed with the aim of lessening the effects of a hangover. The expression originally referred to a method of treatment for a rabid dog bite by placing hair from the dog in a bite wound. Ebenezer Cobham Brewer writes in the Dictionary of Phrase and Fable from 1898, quote, In Scotland, it is a popular belief that a few hairs of the dog that bit you applied to the wound will prevent evil consequences. Applied to drinks, it means if overnight you've indulged too freely, take a glass of the same wine within 24 hours to soothe the nerves. Denise concurs, stating a few pints would sort her head out. Jim laughs to himself here, and then Barb is invited by Denise, which kind of startles Jim. Barb can't go, though, of course, because of baby David, but Denise reasons that Ant is there for that. It'll give him something to do, Jim says, as if he wasn't already planning to go to the precinct. And, you know, it's not really your right to decide what he's going to do with his day, especially if that includes babysitting, nonetheless. Jim then evokes Matthew Kelly. Yeah, what about baby David? Well... You can leave him with Anthony. You just said he's really good with him. Oh, yeah. You'll have the bone bugger something to do anyway, won't it? Yeah. He won't notice if we slip out for a bit, will he? No. <laughs> well, I am. Because tonight, Matthew, I'm going to be completely bloody bladdered. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, he could be referring to several hosts here. Leslie Crowther as well used to do Stars in Their Eyes. But Stars in Their Eyes, I mean, what a classic ITV talent show right there, which, if people are not familiar with, basically members of the public go on, pretend to be the act, uh, dress up as them, come through those esteemed smoky doors. And, uh, yeah, it's like a high-quality sort of tribute act show. And I do have distinct memories as a kid of watching the guy being Freddie Mercury who won the series Maybe that was like 98, 99. He is terrific. You know, he had the moustache, he had the yellow jacket, and most importantly, he had the voice. Dave struggles with the choice, though, here. But Jim needs him to go as he's getting the points in. I mean, we have heard that he's dead generous after all. And the camera work here, directorially, suddenly gets very kinetic. It gets very handheld, as everyone is rushing to leave so they don't have to take care of the grandson or, or their son. You know, I like the angle in particular here of Denise and Barb together stubbing out their ciggies. You know, and from this position, we can see one of the tunnels that babies have in the corner. You know, those things that help with their sensory development, they lie on their back. We can see one of those down there as well, which is cool. It'll be a lovely surprise for him, Denise says in reference to Anthony. I mean, what? You, you can't believe that. You know, she puts more effort into her excuses for not caring for her son than she does in actually caring for him. And consider Jim and Barb here. Well, Dave and Denise as well. You know, they were all tanked up last night and now they're out again proper early. I mean, it must be about 10, 11, you know, considering see the UK is finished. We heard a bit of news on in the background just prior. So they all leave, quietly like, zipping up checking the mirrors, you know. But of course, you can't really hide a door slam. So after they leave, Anthony comes down with baby David and he realises very quickly that everyone has vanished. Oh shit, he says. 
and then immediately looks down at the baby both perhaps as an apology subconsciously for the potty mouth and also just as part of the realization that yep you've been sided with this one who pretty much other than barb you've been taking care of this morning for the most part his parents haven't they've dropped in and dropped out you know but that is anthony isn't it and it's kind of ratcheted up to a whole new level there like when he was younger answering the door doing the teas going down the offy but it's a bit different now he's got to actually take care of a little kid like you know it's, it's way more responsibility that isn't his to have and he doesn't really deserve you know, it's a bit of a comical sitcom type ending, though. You know, you can imagine the canned laughter echoing around as this was filmed on a set. You'd hope they'd be back in a few hours, too. Maybe they'll be gone for one or two pints. But I imagine when they get down the feathers, they won't leave for a good while. And Denise certainly won't be back until Tony carries her in. Okay, guys, as always, really appreciate you listening. If you want to help out the show in any way, there's many ways you can do that. You can follow us on iTunes, on Spotify, and all the various RSS feeds. Our social medias are down below, at the Raw Ramble Pod. Email me, the Raw Ramble Pod at gmail.com. If you want to go a little further, you can hop on the Patreon, help support us there, and get access to the next episode, which at the time of recording this will be decorating. But as you can imagine, we're always an episode ahead, as it were, in the running order. So, yeah, this has been Tom. As always, appreciate you listening. Hope you've enjoyed my rambling thoughts on the Royal Family. And until next time, 